Hello, um, my name is Case Cook. Uh, this is the uh, update on the Kernel Self Protection Project. There are a lot of links and other things, uh, some real eye charts in places. So uh, go ahead and grab the PDF. It's a lot easier to follow along there uh, if you want to take a closer look at some of the some notes uh, that are in here. Anyway, um, let's jump in. So uh, for this talk. Um, Security is a big word that covers a lot of things. So uh, from my perspective, um, the Kernel Cell Protection Project is not just access control. It's not just attack surface reduction or bug fixing uh, or protecting user space um, or memory integrity. Um, these are all parts of security, but what I really want to talk about is kernel cell protection um, and sort of the, the, the mindset uh, that we have for doing this work. Um, so I think the first step is sort of saying what needs protecting. Um, we're, we're really looking at the downstream from the Linux kernel, the, the servers and laptops and phones and TVs and everything else. Uh, the, the latest numbers out of Android are that there are over 3 billion um, Android devices active in 2021. Uh, the majority of those are running 4.14 from 2017, um, with 4.19 slowly catching up. Um, and the, the problem with this from a protection perspective is that the, the flaws that get used um, have a very long lifetime and they're even longer in downstreams. Um, so uh, fundamentally, to get the, the smallest possible lifetime for some of these bugs, you really have to be running the latest kernel um, and, and testing as close to Linux Next as possible. Um, and this advice is really for, for the vendors, uh, as they generally are the only ones who can do anything about the kernels that are running on actual products. Um, now, the, it's, it's a reasonable position for an upstream Linux kernel developer to take um, to say that uh, you know, downstream bug fixing is not their problem. Um, even the bug lifetimes in the upstream kernel are quite long. Um, <clears throat> John Corbett did research uh, into this in 2010 uh, and found that the average time between the introduction of a flaw and it getting fixed was about five years. Um, I started in 2015 trying to track this a little bit more closely and see uh, what I could see. And uh, looking at critical and high vulnerabilities, um, they started to creep up towards six years uh, for a while. And I was worried that this number was just going to keep getting longer and longer because, um, because sort of the, the start of Git history for the kernel that was where a lot of these flaws were coming from, from long ago. So I had this concern that we'd have this huge, long tail and it would pull the, the average down. Um, but uh, more recently, it's, it's started to fall again and we've sort of stabilized at about five and a half years. Um, it's been a while since the last critical bug, so I'm sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop on that one, since I'm sure there's something in the kernel waiting to be discovered. Um, and since uh, 2020, we added uh, 20 more sort of high priority flaws, which is a recent high. I'm going to thank the pandemic for that, for everybody staying home and doing tons of security research. Um, it was falling for quite some time. You can see our high, the, the highest we've had was in 2017 was our highest growth, and that slowly started to fall. Um, and then uh, I don't look too closely at the medium and lows just because they those flaws don't tend to get sufficiently accurate. Uh, like originating commit analysis, where, where did the flow actually come from? Um, so if we take a look at the, the history of, of these critical and high CVEs, um, we can see the kernel version is along the left side. Uh, the, the most recent kernel release is at the top and the bottom is the beginning of Git history. Um, and then just sort of looking at the CVEs uh, in, in order of when they were fixed, uh, basically. So you can see that uh, and then when they were, when the flaw was introduced. Uh, so there's these long tails that for a while were reaching all the way back into uh, the Git history. Um, and I was, we sort of saw this, this hint that we were beginning to lift up out of Git history into more recent stuff and that we might start seeing a, a shorter cycle time uh, on how long it took to fix some of these things. And actually it turns out that that, that appears to have happened pretty much for, um, during 2020 is we had no um, critical and high CVEs that had their point of introduction uh, be before Git history. Um, so that's that's nice that we've actually started to lift that out. Unfortunately, we still have a couple of these that have really, really long lifetimes um, that are dragging the average down. Um, we can see that we have fewer 
flaws going in, uh, at least the critical and highs. Um, and their lifetime is sort of getting smaller compared to earlier in the graph, uh, but we still have some, you know, really ugly ones that took a long time uh, to get to get noticed and fixed. Uh, so the um, question I get sometimes is, you know, well, who cares about the lifetime of these flaws? We, we you know, it's just about how long it takes to get them fixed once they're once they're discovered. Um, and the, the trouble is that, that attackers are uh, quite motivated to find the flaws, and as a result, um, they're finding them way before uh, defenders do. So, and and we know this is true. They are watching. They occasionally will boast about having found, you know, the the old days when they got committed to the kernel. So um, it's, not, it's not theoretical. Um, the, the actual flaws and the actual lifetimes uh, based on when they were introduced has, has meaningful uh, value to, to analyzing this. Um, bug fighting continues, of course, uh, and we're finding them all kinds of tools. Um, you know, the, the compilers themselves uh, spit out warnings that get fixed uh, before things go in. Uh, there's a lot of static checkers that we're using, a lot of dynamic checkers. Um, I'll call out syscaller in particular. There's a huge dashboard where it's collecting almost a thousand um, security relevant flaws that it's uh, that it's found, um, that, or rather, I should say, reports. Uh, it is up to folks to triage and and diagnose the reports to figure out the, the true cause of the problems. Um, and there, these bugs are getting fixed. Um, we uh, on the syscaller side, while it's growing by a couple hundred a year, we're also fixing. Um, an order of magnitude more than that uh, every year as well. Um, and you can you can see these going into the stable trees. Um, you, you could ask Greg uh, if you want to email him, but I looked it up for this presentation. So as of the 5.10.66 stable release, which is the most recent uh, long-term support kernel, uh, there are 8,463 fixes committed, um, which is an average of about 128 fixes uh, per stable release version. Um, so a lot of bug fixes are going in. As far as bugs go, we're just going to keep introducing them. Uh, the kernel is written in C. It's uh, we're, we're prone to get stuff wrong um, because the compilers can help us help can only help us so much. Um, and the thing to drive home from the, the prior graph is that um, the the bugs in the kernel exist whether we uh, whether we know about them or not. Uh, they are there. They're waiting to be discovered, and they might be getting used uh, already. By, by attackers. Uh, Whack-a-mole on bugs is not, is not a strategy. Um, I always come back to the analogy that, um, that Constantine gave in the 2015 LSS um, uh, to between Linux development, like the kernel, and the 1960s US car industry, uh, where things were designed to run well, um, but they weren't exactly designed to fail. Um, so uh, in this, this image here is the, uh, there's a 1959 Bel Air on the left and a 2009 uh, Chevy Malibu. And I can't even see the crash test dummy on the collapsed driver's side compartment uh, in, the, in the 1959 car. Like it was not designed to fail. Uh, it drove well and it was fine, but uh, in a crash, the whole front end would be destroyed. Uh, whereas uh, the 2009 fare is much better because it was designed with you know failure in mind. Um, so a similar thing needs to be applied to uh, the kernel as well. It needs to handle failures, which in this case means attacks, uh, you know, intentionally malicious manipulations. It needs to handle that safely. Um, on the whole, user space is becoming more difficult to attack, uh, and containers paint a big target on the kernel since all the containers share the same host kernel. Um, and fundamentally, lives depend on Linux. We saw a list of devices that are uh, they're running the kernel now. Um, so, killing bugs is nice. Uh, there is some truth to the observation that um, security bugs are just normal bugs. Um, one person's security bug may not be a security bug to someone else. Um, it, it really depends on, on a number of factors, you know, what was built in, what's being used, reachability to an API, etc. And, and there isn't really a common theme to the bugs that attackers are going to be using. Generally speaking, it's whatever is useful to them. Um, additionally, bugs may be in out-of-tree code, so this is an un-upstream vendor driver or something, and it's not an excuse for upstream devs to say, oh, that's not our problem. Like, well, if there's, if there's an API or a language feature that allows for a bug to be introduced, um, that's, that's not good, and we should do things to discourage that an out-of-tree uh, you know, out code 
will have that bug. So we want to kill entire classes of bugs. Um, this is more than just about the security piece of it, because generally speaking, this improves robustness. Like if we can kill an entire class of bugs, um, the, the cases where that bug, you know, is vulnerable to some kind of security relevant uh, issue, uh, can be a subset of, of all the all the bugs that a class may introduce. Uh, but those bugs exist for other things. Um, you know, just behavioral anomalies. So the general robustness of the kernel is improved when we're actually killing bug classes. Uh, and if we kill the class, they can't be reintroduced, which is really the only way to get ahead of the whack-a-mole situation. Um, so the only problem, of course, is that we'll never kill all the bug classes. So we also need to deal with how they are used to exploit the kernel. Um, we have to stop their exploitation, stop what they, you know, block their, their targets, reduce information exposures, um, basically remove anything that assists attackers. Um, and I think the position morally is that we need to do that even if it makes development more difficult. Um, this can be very tricky because an attacker and someone debugging the kernel to try and fix something uh, have, have a very similar set of tools um, as far as what they need from the kernel. Uh, so it can be a fine line to walk, but generally speaking, you know, the car designer has to figure out what to do about, you know, the seatbelt path and where the reinforcement in the doors is going to go, things like that. It makes their lives more difficult, but the safety matters. Um, so another piece of this, of course, is uh, that a big problem are the language features, uh, or perhaps lack of language features uh, with C. Um, the kernel benefits from being written in C. It's a portable assembler. Uh, we need the low level control. It's, 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 it's that way for a reason. Um, and replacing C has been a difficult proposition for a long time. Um, we are, however, to the point where Rust is sufficiently low level um, to, to do similar things and provide the kind of speed uh, that's needed uh, without um, getting in the way. Uh, and we've got now actual working versions of this. Um, there's the proposal to get Rust building in the kernel, and we can start removing um, drivers uh, and replacing them with Rust stuff uh, so that they're, they're in better shape. Um, this is going to take some time. Um, so I like to think of this as sort of meeting in the middle. Um, we're going to continue to remove dangerous things from C itself. Um, the kernel already forked C a long time ago. Um, so um, my view is as we remove dangerous feature use uh, from the kernel on the C side, we can start adding more and more rust on the other side, and eventually we can meet in a good place where a lot of the things that are more error prone uh, are, are written in rust and they're just as fast, if not faster. Um, but they don't have the, you know, concurrency problems, the use after free problems. There's a whole set of these problems that is just gone uh, for, for the Rust side of things. And uh, so that's sort of um, the, the rationale, the thinking uh, behind the kernel self-protection project. And like, like NetDev is upstream and concerns itself with networking, um, KSVP is upstream and concerns itself with security, um, trying to make sure that we're getting rid of these bug classes, that we're getting rid of exploitation techniques, um, and, and trying to clear the path for, for getting Rust in, um, whatever, whatever we can all do to help. Um, it's sort of an umbrella project. Um, I used to say our attitude was, you know, slow and steady and we'll, we'll get there. And, uh, I much prefer Alexander Popov's suggested motto, uh, which is flexible and persistent, and that we can adapt to the changing requirements uh, in the development uh, ecosystem, and but we're persistent. We really, really need to continue to remove the dangerous pieces uh, of the kernel and the, and the language that we're using, um, and we'll get there. We, we've got an issue tracker, and everything's in there. You can see us uh, slowly making progress through it. Um, please come join us. We've got a lot of little things that need help, too. So here is uh, two years worth of kernel releases. I didn't do a status update in 2020. So um, September 2019, we saw the release of 5.3. Um, this was uh, our sort of initial end of the implicit fall-through work um, that was going on to remove that whole class of vulnerability where switch statements in C don't 
uh, it's, there's no semantic marking for whether or not you intend to fall through to a switch statement. Um, and we had roughly a 1 in 10 cases of these were a legitimate bug. Uh, so it was worth it to go through and just fix all of these because we could actually find them all uh, and then turn on the warning so we never see that flaw again. Um, and uh, so 5.3, we saw the, uh, the addition of that so we wouldn't gain any more. Um, we were doing ref count conversions so we wouldn't have uh, ref counters uh, wrap around to zero. Um, more uh, PID FD work uh, so that we don't have uh, you know, so process descriptors as opposed to using an ID that might recycle. Um, on XA6, we gained uh, pinning of the CR4 and CR0 values, which control a bunch of the CPU features like uh, SNEP, SNAP, um, write protect. Um, and so we did our best to make sure that that wouldn't get flipped when we weren't expecting it. Uh, as that's been a common exploit technique. Um, we also gained uh, heap variable auto initialization. So if you boot with init on alloc equal one, um, all heap allocations will be zeroed automatically. And that gets rid of a whole class of uh, heap, heap uninitialized heap vulnerabilities. Uh, more sanity checker for the allocator. Um, we got KSLR enabled by default on ARM64 and we gained some documentation externally for how to deal with hardware security flaws like Meltdown. And 5.4, we continued with the development of uh, PIDFD in the kernel. Um, we gained, the kernel gained the lockdown LSM uh, for trying to have a bright line between UID zero on a system and actual kernel memory. Um, the, the, either not allowing uh, root user to change memory contents uh, as a, sort of the in integrity barrier. And then uh, if you want to go a step further, uh, you could set that to the confidentiality barrier, which means root user isn't supposed to be able to even see the contents of kernel memory. Um, there's now uh, the, the tag memory relaxed syscall ABI, basically allowing uh, tagged addresses through the ABI for the architectures that support hardware memory tagging, and sort of clearing the path for that. Um, made some improvements to boot entropy, um, blocking rights to swap files. That was funny. You could actually write to a swap file, even though it was being used for swap. That's not great. You can corrupt all sorts of things. Um, one of the many sources of overflows has been, um, you know, string values, trying to uh, copy huge sizes. So trying to detect uh, ridiculous overflows. If you see a size that's greater than int max, it means probably you wrapped around and something believes it's negative. Dropped a uh, linker support um, for uh, for sort of an experimental linker. Intel TSX was removed, support for it was removed, and we continued refactoring ref counts. Um, perf has been sort of a persistent source of, of flaws, so um, there was a desire to be able to turn it off with a much larger hammer, um, and so finally we gained hooks to do that from the LSM side. Um, also got uh, ref count T used to have sort of custom per architecture implementations. Uh, and it was a fast generic one in C was written um, that uh, gives us greater coverage across architectures. We got some cleanups for exception tables and other linker script issues. KSLR was uh, enabled for PowerPC32. Um, SecComp gained RISC-V support. Um, and for user notifications, you could actually continue a, a syscall if it was, it was deemed you know, good enough to go through. That way, uh, second monitors didn't have to do those kinds of things on, on its behalf to say, yeah, go ahead. Um, the EFI randomness protocol uh, was implemented for x86. ARM64 had been using it for a while. Um, coverage for Fortify, uh, Fortify source was added for MIPS. Um, and similar to the other size limits, uh, the copy to and from user sizes were limited in max as well. KSAN grew support for dealing with VMAP memory. Um, and in the in the world of VMAP stacks, that's that's nice. Uh, and there's a lot of VMALX stuff that's uh, moved around and used as well. So gaining KSAM use after free analysis of that is important. Uh, MIPS gained the ability to work with the GCC plugins. Um, user fault FD started to gain some protections, uh, but we'll come back to that soon. Uh, 5.6 saw the upstream of WireGuard. Uh, that was a long path and really required a lot of crypto changes. Um, Open at two syscall gain something that's long been wanted is is the ability to say hey look up this path but don't go 
know, don't go upwards. Don't be tricked by having, you know, seeing dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash in your in your path. And certainly, don't be tricked by symlinks uh, that got created. So um, all those things uh, have finally landed for OpenAt2. Um, PIDFD continued to grow. Um, IOU ring gained the ability to actually open files. Um, we replaced the the blocking random pool uh, that existed forever. Um, ARM64 gained support for an on-chip random number generator uh, and the E0PD support, which is basically constant time memory faults, uh, so you don't end up with timing attacks uh, trying to look into um, kernel memory, sort of the, the way Meltdown uh, worked. Uh, the idea being there that you could turn off KPTI but turn on E0PD and you'd have no signal uh, about what's happening with uh, memory contents. Um, PowerPC32 gained uh, VMAX, VMAP stack support. Um, and as part of this, more and more architectures doing sort of the common stuff about protecting page tables. Uh, things were rearranged so you get generic page table dumping for debugging. Um, and then in earnest, we started replacing uh, zero length and single element arrays uh, with flexible arrays. Um, this is sort of a, a long, long time coming ancient, ancient C code used to have a single element array at the end of a structure and just pretend it wasn't a single element and would allocate more space than just the size of the struct and you know, put a bunch of elements at the end um, because a zero size wasn't, uh, wasn't legal. And then zero length got added at some point uh, and served the same purpose. But again, the compiler has no idea what's going on because it can't see uh, or rather it expects it to be actually zero length and uh, gets treated strangely. Um, so flexible arrays were added to the C-spec uh, and that's a, those are empty brackets, no zero, no one, nothing like that. Um, going through the kernel and replacing all the places where we have zero and one element arrays uh, so that we can actually start doing sensible bounds checking on these things uh, has, has been taking a long time, as you can see. We are still working on it and this got started in earnest in March of 2020. Um, there's a lot of them because there's a lot of old code. 5.7 saw the addition of uh, pointer authentication for R64. Uh, we gained the BPF LSM, so you can, you know, from BPF now hook any portion of the LSM uh, hooks, uh, which leads uh, allows for some some very creative uh, things that you can monitor. Um, there was a long history of exec deadlocking problems, uh, you know, like against PStore and signal handlers and some other stuff. So there was a major refactoring of ex exec VE. Um, made some improvements to the free list obfuscation um, with some feedback from a couple of researchers on what aspects of that were was weak. Um, Risk five gained uh, the the strict kernel memory protections, um, so you can't you know write to the kernel text anymore. You can't you know if you gain a, a write primitive as an attacker uh, on Risk five, you can't just write to the code um, and change it. Um, one of the sanity checkers. Uh, UV SAN, the undefined behavior sanitizer, um, and it was sort of one big knob in the kernel, but it has a whole bunch of little pieces uh, doing different types of checks. And the bounds sanitizer, which checks array indexes, uh, is actually uh, very performant and lets you do runtime array index checking. Um, so that got split off from the main config UV SAN and got turned on and led to sort of an ongoing um, ongoing work to, to find and, and kill off any of the, the problems we've had with out-of-bounds array indexes. And there's sort of a slow uh, s slow and steady set of reports on that every release of a couple more getting fixed. Um, another problem is with um, how SNPrintf gets used to append, you know, several SNPrintf calls in a row get appended, uh, in, are appending to a single buffer, uh, and you end up with some unexpected results at the end. So we've been refactoring that to use a CN printf, which will, will return zero if you run out of room. So you can't just keep on adding stuff. Um, so yeah, and refactoring from prior releases uh, has continued, the flexible arrays, the ref counts. Um, in 5.8, um, ARM64 gained BTI and uh, the shadow call stack. So uh, BTI is uh, where we get a, a, a sort of weak forward control flow integrity where we can only jump into uh, places where we're actually expecting a jump target. Um, and that can narrow the scope of execute control 
that an attacker might have. Uh, the shadow call stack support was uh, another way of doing this, but um, in sort of in reverse, so it's for the, the backward edge side of this, but it's still, that's a software piece. Um, the concurrency sanitizer infrastructure got added, so we can actually start examining data races uh, and, and proving those out. Um, gain a couple more capabilities, uh, one for using um, sort of BPF things, split that off of CAP sysadmin, uh, similarly for perf. Um, there's a bunch of RNG improvements, so a lot of these are driven by observations off the network. Um, you know, various various pieces of the network use random numbers, um, so trying to make improvements there has been an ongoing effort as well. Um, there are a bunch of places where we were leaking, potentially leaking kernel addresses uh, for processes that didn't have CAP syslog. Um, got through that. Um, RISC-V, as part of its kernel memory protection, uh, started reporting about any places where it encounters a writable and executable kernel memory, um, and the exact refactoring continues. There was a refactoring of the proc implementation so that there could be multiple instances of proc so you could actually remount things with different features and like different visibility characteristics. Um, so setfs has been a long time problem in the kernel as far as uh, how the kernel would choose whether or not it was attempting to write user space or kernel space. Um, so the, the like the removal started in 5.8, sort of laying the groundwork for what it was going to take to have uh, explicit kernel addresses and explicit user space addresses without just looking at its value, uh, which is what setfs would do. But read implies exact was a workaround for the, the transition long ago of actually gaining um, execute control over memory. And um, this, this kind of uh, workaround was never needed for the architectures that natively uh, supported execute permissions. Uh, so we sort of removed all of that because they were getting in the way. And we have the continuing refactoring. With 5.9, we gained, um, or SecComp gained the ability with its user notification filtering to um, actually inject file descriptors into um, the, the SecComp process. The monitor could, uh, could find the places where it needed to hand back a file descriptor uh, as opposed to just saying, no, you can't do that could say, here, yeah, that totally happened, and here's a file descriptor you should have gotten. Um, and we gained uh, three more architecture support uh, for SciComp, which was, I think, the most we've ever had in one release. Um, Clang uh, stack variable auto-initialization uh, support was added, so we can zero init stack variables, uh, and you know, like that entire class of uninitialized stack variable just goes away. Um, which is a pretty big deal. Um, there was a huge rewrite of the syscall entry and exit routines, which are normally very architecture specific, but they all do fundamentally the same sets of checks and things for validating state and dealing with uh, interrupts and signals. And there's a whole bunch of really common code and um, fixes for various things were sort of out of sync between different architectures. So the idea was to collect all of that into one place where it can all be done correctly. Um, this also lets us have a single location where we can make some changes to syscall stuff in the future if we need to. Um, there's some more uh, slab hardening that got added. Um, we added another capability for checkpoint restore, splitting that again off of Capsis admin. Um, Debug FS uh, gained sort of the a, a boot time visibility restriction. In other words, you could turn off debug FS from, from the boot command line. Um, RS5 gained stack protector support, uh, so it didn't have a canary before, and now it can. Um, part of uh, an API that was storing a bunch of function pointers uh, on the heap was the Tasklet API. So uh, the work began to sort of redesign that and get rid of it. Um, XA6 grew its uh, FSGS base implementation. That that led to a lot of work around out of tree modules that were trying to use that, um, but could land a system into a very vulnerable state. Uh, so the idea was to sort of actually make that happen correctly in upstream, so we wouldn't uh, expose. In, so out of tree modules would not end up exposing insane things to user space. Uh, similarly, we wanted to filter MSR writes because those are uh, incredibly privileged as well. Um, the uninitialized variable macro was removed from the kernel. Um, this masked warnings 
uh, for a long time, but it also masked all kinds of other mistakes. Uh, so we just tore it out and actually fixed things correctly. Um, it was a workaround we didn't need that was getting in the way of other work. And there's, again, the ongoing um, refactoring. Uh, so uh, 5.10 saw yet more <laughs> round number generator uh, improvements. Um, this was for um, the, the pRandom subsystem now, which uh, one of the larger users is the network, uh, network code. Um, Safe set ID LSM gained uh, group ID awareness. It had been only UID aware until this point. Um, the LSM gained more hooks for when the kernel reads various files uh, for like loading modules or firmware or other things like that. Uh, now the LSM can more thoroughly examine what was happening there. Uh, now that the setfs work came along, uh, setfs was officially removed from x86, risk v and PowerPC. So the, that whole class of vulnerability, that, that exploitation method is, is gone from those architectures from this point forward. Um, to deal with some of the refactoring around the uh, SM printf stuff we talked about earlier, SysFS has no view into the C file at API. Um, so we just added this uh, another helper, uh, and that would keep it from overflowing. Um, the, the mount subsystem gained the no sim follow option, which is pretty great. Uh, this is kind of like, oh, no sim link uh, in, in OpenAT2, uh, but this is for the entire mount. You know, whatever you're mounting, suddenly all the sim links are disabled uh, and won't work. Um, the AMD SEV uh, subsystem gained register encryption support um, for uh, virtualized guests. Um, ARM64's memory tagging extension support got added, so we can actually do checking of the length of allocations because they've been tagged for a specific uh, range. And if you try to access beyond that range, uh, the tags stop matching and uh, you'll get caught. Um, an Atari API for doing static calls was added, and this is to replace global function pointers. While the coverage is interesting, a lot of the global function pointers tended to already be marked uh, read-only after init. Um, and for those that we couldn't do that with, the static call gives us coverage because now you actually have to go through uh, work to do those updates because it actually does an in-place text update uh, on a kernel. You can't just write to a function pointer, um, so that's nice. Um, and here in 5.10 is when work started on dealing with implicit fall through again, uh, this time for Clang. Uh, as it turns out, Clang has a much, much more strict view of uh, what implicit fall through looks like. And there's now a whole bunch more of implicit fall through work to do to, do to get Clang coverage as well. And of course, the refactoring continues. In 5.11, um, we split up sort of the remainder of config UBSAN because we were having uh, quite a bit of success with uh, bounds flaws getting fixed. Um, so we opened it up for other things like, uh, you know, shift overflows at runtime, things like that. Um, ARM32 gained uh, KSAN support and um, uh, also added poisoning to its signal page so it couldn't be used uh, as a target. Um, and ARM64's ASAM gained the hardware tag support, so building on the MTE work from the prior release. And ARM64 saw setfs removed. In the fortified string functions, before you could write past the end of a string, but not past the end of the structure that surrounded the string. Uh, and for strings, that didn't really make any sense. Uh, you just need to stop at the end of the string buffer. Uh, a really nice one is the unprivileged user fault FD sys control. Uh, this now defaults to safe, which is to say that a user space, like a normal user space process, like cannot catch a fault for code that is running in kernel in kernel space. So uh, this removes the, the user fault FD uh, exploit method for gaining uh, better time and control uh, or or slab layout control uh, when when performing attacks. Um, we're still left with fuse as as a path to that, um, but that one is much more easily controlled. The um, config page poisoning zero no sanity was removed since it's redundant to um, the init on alloc work um, and sort of got in the way of things. Um, syscall user dispatch was added. This is an interesting way to basically have better emulators. Um, this was added for Wine uh, to deal with having a, a separate syscall definition where you're you know not actually calling into the kernel, the, the actual Linux kernel, you want to do something else. Um, so it's a way to dispatch in user space uh, to a different syscall handler that was defined by user space for itself. 
Um, Secomp gained constant time bitmaps. So the idea being that if uh, if the composition of all the filters for a given syscall always produce the same result no matter what, you know, it's not variable in any way, uh, there's no reason to actually have to walk all of the filters to get that answer every time you do a syscall. You can just immediately return the result. Um, and that sped up uh, a lot of the more complex uh, SECOMP filters. I'd say around now is also when um, the, there was a, a bigger effort being made to replace string copy, string L copy, and string N copy with a string S copy and its and its family members, um, and then we continue to more more ongoing refactoring. And 5.12, um, UBSAN, which had grown all these things that we were actually catching real flaws from, uh, had the integer overflow checks torn out because if you use GCC 8 or later, it just doesn't work, um, which is a problem. Uh, we're going to have to readdress that, but we need help from um, the compiler side of the world. Um, KFence, which is sort of lightweight KSAN, uh, which will still catch heap out of bounds and use after freeze, uh, but it's it's uh, it's not deterministic. Um, but at the same time, its overhead is incredibly incredibly small, so it's designed for production workloads to catch uh, catch weird things. Um, KCompare, which is used to compare different kernel objects, uh, became more available. Um, there was the idea of that perhaps it was a bit of an information leak, but for the most part, it's not. Um, and some of the graphic systems are really depending on it for being able to compare file descriptors and other things. Um, gained, uh, kernel gained uh, mount set adder, which was for basically having user namespace aware mounts and doing uh, user ID mapping. Um, per task stack canaries uh, was enabled for RISC-V. Um, before it was a global, uh, ARM32 still has this as a global. There's a single global canary. Um, so uh, this work was uh, sort of coordinated between the compiler and uh, the kernel. And we're starting to see more of that in, in some of the other architectures. Uh, another big deal was the Clang LTO support landed uh, as a precursor to getting CFI working uh, as, a, as a protection mechanism. And again, ongoing refactoring. In 5.13, we gained um, the Landlock LSM, uh, which gets us a, a much higher level uh, bit of control over, for example, file system access that SecComp really was not designed to deal with. Clang's CFI for ARM64 landed, uh, so that finally gets into upstream what's been in Android for I think the past three years um, as, a, as a protection mechanism against um, attackers uh, gaining execute control. Also gained uh, the per syscall kernel stack offset randomizations. There's a lot of attacks that sort of depended on being able to have a predictable kernel stack location. There was a lot of discussion around entropy and methods and how to do it and where to put it and all this other stuff. Uh, so there was a long path to finally getting that landed. <clears throat> we wanted to check uh, writes in, in procpid adder uh, against the file opener, not against what the privilege of the writer was, is a, a common confused deputy issue. Uh, while most distros had already done this forever ago, dev kmm was officially removed um, in 5.13. Uh, you don't need to just see all the kernel memory just sitting in dev. Um, setfs was removed from MIPS. Um, execute only memory support for ARM64 returned uh, under EPAN, which I think is an ARM v8.7 uh, feature. Fortify source was enabled for RISC V. Um, and an interesting note is that x86 uh, IA32, the stack protector support was removed in the kernel unless you have uh, GCC 8.1 or later. Uh, so if you're running IA32 and you care about security, which already seems strange, uh, you really, really need a modern compiler to use the modern way of specifying stack canary locations, which is what uh, RISC-V was doing um, a couple uh, kernel releases earlier here. And of course, the ongoing refactoring, implicit fall through, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is now our most recent release, 5.14. Again, more around number generator improvements. Um, MFD secret syscall was added. This is an interesting one because uh, it's mostly designed for dealing with accidents, um, an intentional attempt to try to pull memory, pull the secret memory out of the process is, is pretty straightforward with ptrace. Um, but the idea is that, or the, I should say the memory has been arranged so that the kernel can't accidentally read those things. It needs to be able to, needs to do it from the perspective of the process itself. Um, and I think this leads the way to having
uh, more per process page table protections. Uh, I'm hoping we can build on that and get us close to something like XBFO in the future. Um, RISC-V gain VMAP stack, um, and SecComp gain the ability to add those file descriptors that I talked about earlier, and also send a reply about it at the same time, um, because that was racy and while not a security issue, would confuse um, the, the SecComped processes at times. Um, also started doing some refactoring around how memcopy operates. I talked about the um, inter versus intra object checking for strings uh, for, for the string family of functions. For the memcopy set of functions, this is not nearly as straightforward. So there was a lot of refactoring needed to, to pave the way for being able to let that, uh, to, to be able to properly balance check those things. And ongoing refactoring. Uh, expected for 5.15, we're through the merge window now, so I can sort of look at what's in there already. Um, there's uh, another push for replacing open coded size arithmetic with struct size, uh, and that, that, so that's beginning again. Um, KV malloc was loaded to int max. Um, UVSAN became available for RISC-V. Uh, ZFS was removed for ARM32, which was um, sort of like one of the last remaining architectures that we would see those exploits explicitly used on. L1D flushing API was added, so it was sort of a, a large hammer for dealing with potentially unknown uh, future side channel attacks that might be using the cache. The uh, GCC 11 gained the uh, call used register clearing. Uh, and the idea here is sort of another data lifetime reduction feature, which is at the end of every function, you clear all the registers that got used in that function um, that weren't already, aren't about to get restored from the stack. Um, and that means you're going to leak a lot less from function to function. Um, and of course, we've got a bunch of ongoing refactoring, just like all the others. And then plan for 5.16, uh, the stuff that's sitting in next. Um, we've got uh, implicit fall through enabled for Clang. So all the other implicit fall through work uh, has, has finished, we're hoping. Um, the alloc size attributes got added to the allocators. So the, the compiler has more of a hint about what's going on uh, that can, might be able to check things at compile time. Um, there's a helper being added for dealing with flexible arrays in really weird situations, um, you know, alone in a structure or as part of a union, some other places where normal conventions are difficult, as well as a way to specify a subgroup of members within a structure and some additional memset uh, helpers for dealing with that. Uh, and then again, ongoing refactoring. And uh, it looks like we've got thread info in task um, for ARM32. There's a bunch of other soon and not so soon features um, that I'll just leave on this list. I don't need to read through. You can if you want to. Um, we've still got a lot of challenges. Um, there's a lot of conservatism in, in the kernel. We don't want to change stuff, uh, but I think that gets better with having more testing in kernel CI kinds of things. Uh, we need to take responsibility for the sort of the APIs and language features that make the kernel uh, a little unstable for uh, when it's under attack. And we got to sacrifice our time and be patient with each other. Um, there's certainly a lot of complexity. We need to deal with uh, finding new ways to do things and finding ways to work together. Um, so as far as resources, more developers, more reviewers, more testers, more backporters, all this stuff is needed. Um, and that's sort of universal. It's not anything specific to security. If you have any thoughts, uh, please email me or, or use Twitter or uh, I'm on that IRC channel. Um, and you can see the slides and, and join the project more directly. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. See you next time.